to mention because I, I wanted to show you another side of Rizal, a curious Rizal, uh, a high Rizal. No? <laughs> <laughs> now, lest we be fixated with Rizal and Hashish, I want to emphasize that Rizal the liberal was also being nurtured at this time in Manila. And I believe Ateneo and even the other school, the University of Santa Tomas, were probably part of the environment that produced Rizal the Inquirer. Rizal most certainly had access to Western books even before he reached Europe. There were bookstores in Manila. Uh, the Dominicans, uh, for, despite all the talk about their conservatism, had a wonderful library, which included many books uh, that one would have thought were banned. You, know, you could find Rousseau in there, in, in, in their collection, in the Friars' collections. So. Uh, Rizal also had an uncle who was very cosmopolitan with many foreign visitors. So this may have added to Rizal's curiosity about the world and the ideas of the Enlightenment. OK, so we're going to go, uh, since we already saw those slides, no? there's some. So Rizal went on to Madrid. No? And at the Central University of Madrid, Rizal went for more advanced medical studies. But uh, people don't know, he, he did not finish his doctorate in medicine. Okay? He, he is a doctor, though. The, the system was different at the time. What he got in UST was not a, a, an MD. No? It was sort of an undergraduate degree, which is why he went on to Madrid. But he did not complete his doctorate in medicine. He got his doctorate in philosophy and letters because he was more interested in philosophy and letters and in the arts. He also took art classes and fencing. Uh, and, and we see here that maybe his priorities were changing, you know, which I don't think made him less the doctor. It probably added to, to him as a, as a healer. So, now, I wanted to mention a speech he delivered in 1884, because we're going to look now at results struggling with science. In a speech delivered in 1884 to honor Juan Luna and Felix Hidalgo, who had won awards in an exposition, Rizal had very fiery words. You see the nationalists emerging here. He's, he was very proud of their, bit, of their prize. And he said, the Oriental Chrysalis is breaking out of its sheet. And that race, notice the racial language here, plunged in lethargy during the night of the history, while the sun illuminated the other continents, continents, awakes anew, confirming the eternal laws of constant evolution, periodic change, and progress. His idea was that we were in the Dark Ages and that one would come out of it. No? And that it, the proof here, of course, was that two, the two, and I'm very reluctant to use the word Filipino, because in Rizal's time, Filipino actually referred to the Creoles. These were the Spaniards born in the Philippines. Rizal, uh, as a Chinese mestizo, and the Indios were not considered Filipino. So you can see here, Rizal, the Illustrado. Illustrado actually means the illuminated, no? people who are enlightened. No? Um, thinking of evolution, change, and progress with metaphors of light and darkness. The speech found its way to the Philippines and were published in the newspapers here. No? And a few months later, his elder brother writes Rizal telling him his mother has been quite ill, mainly because she was so upset with his speech and worried that it would get him into trouble. And Rizal's mother eventually writes him saying how sad she was, and, and reminding him, do not fail in your duties as a real Christian, for it is sweeter to me that you're acquiring, uh, than you're acquiring greater knowledge, because sometimes knowledge is what leads us to ruin. So I'm, I'm trying to give you a glimpse now of the struggles that he had, a struggle with his own mother, who felt that faith, keeping the faith, was more important than acquiring knowledge, that knowledge was actually uh, dangerous. What did Rizal, what was Rizal's response? Response, when he said, I have not for one moment stopped believing in the fundamental principles of our religion. What I believe now, I believe by reasoning, okay? uh, because my conscience can accept only what is compatible with reason. So we see here Rizal, the scientist, emerging. But he goes on to say, for me, religion is the holiest of things. If someday I were to get a little of that divine spark called science, the so science is divine. No? I would not hesitate to use it for God. And if I should err or go astray in my reasoning, God will not punish me. You see here now his, his struggles, no? his, his, his dealing, no? grappling with his faith. No? OK, so this is Rizal, the son, 23 years old, confronted by his mother's grief over his liberalism and what she feels was a drifting away from Christianity. But that did not stop him. 
and we see Rizal the scientist in Europe continue his work. It's very it's surprising Rizal's biographer, the one who names him as a conchographer and everything else, did not list anthropology and ethnology as his professions. But these sciences, together with philology, which is a study of languages, folklore and history, were to be his passions while he was in Europe. And he had prolific output here, writing about everything from Tagalog folklore, Tagalog grammar, to the annotations to Morga's successes. Uh, what happened here, this is a very early work by Spaniard. He went to the library, copied it by hand, and annotated the entire book, saying that, that Morga was wrong here, Morga got it. Uh, Morga misinterpret, misinterpreted certain things. Uh, his whole point here was to, to bring out the Filipino. Um, we, we forget that even his two novels were what we would call creative nonfiction today because they were really thinly disguised, disguised descriptions of real people, places, and events. No? And teaching anthropology, I often tell my students to read the two novels to get a glimpse of Manila's culture in the 19th century. So Rizal used the social sciences and the humanities in his search for the Filipino. His interest in anthropology reflected his European counterpart's obsession with race, except that Rizal was intent on proving there were no differences among the races when it came to intellect. He engaged the, the Europeans in, his, in their own turf, uh, using archaeology, anthropology, history, which are all sciences dominated by the Europeans. Uh, Rizal was the quintessential uh, Indio Bravo, the brave Indio, speaking up and raising questions. As a footnote here, Rizal coined the term Indio Bravo after seeing Buffalo Bill's Indians at the Madrid Exposition. Buffalo Bill was there with some American Indians and he was fascinated by the term. So Rizal in, in, Europe, in Europe was spurred by the ideas of the Enlightenment. His, his idea was that education was the key to human development and in the search for freedom you needed that Education, but he was also influenced by. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed out on Bloom and Trip. No? I'm sorry, we. It's. I'm not used to this particular remote. Cousin. So I'll continue reading. No? You, Bloom and Trip was uh, a Filipinist. No? He was an expert on the Philippines, but Rizal had extensive correspondence with him. In one of his letters, he also points out. Is it the middle thing that I should be pressing? OK, here's an example. Here's the native, you know, audacious enough to be advising your Western expert on the Philippines. For instance, Blumentritt said, should I be going to the Madrid Exposition? He heard that there was an exhibit there that was interesting. It was an exhibit of Igoros. No? And Rizal said, don't mind the Philippine Exposition. Madrid, naawa siya sa mga Igorots. No? He said, we're going to catch pneumonia. No? Actually, privately, he was very ashamed that Igorots were being displayed because he felt that that would give the wrong impression to, to Europeans about what the Filipino was. No? So he, he also had his biases, no? and it's important to, uh, to recognize that this is part of his search yet for what a Filipino was. No? OK, I was talking about Johann Herder. Herder was a German philosopher and theologian who also influenced Rizal. No? Uh, Rizal uh, was very happy. He got 38 volumes. He got the complete works of Herder. 38 volumes. No? He was into this. He was buying books. He had the complete books of Schiller. He had the complete books of, uh, there was someone who wrote on religions. No? Apparently, he read all of them. Uh, and Herder, Herder was someone who said that it's in language that shapes our thought and that it is important to use history as an instrument for the most genuine of patriotic spirit. So what Rizal did was to do history, to do folklore as part of nation building. He was obsessed with creating a sense of nationhood because there was no nationhood to speak of at that time. You know? uh, and you see the influence of Herder in his novels. There's Simon exhorting Basilio, who, who I always say was the first Ateneo medical school student because in the novel, Basilio comes out to be a medical student in Ateneo. But Ateneo did not have a medical school at that time. You know? So Rizal actually, for so, <laughs> 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 so, 
magician or <laughs> no? uh, and here it is the Montpelling Basilio. No? Cultivate your own language, extend it, preserve to the people their own way of thinking, aspire to be a nation, and sooner or later, you will have your liberty. No? Basilio was the son of Sisa, the, one, the woman who went insane no? and eventually went on to the Athenaeus School of Medicine. <laughs> so uh, Rizal was really obsessed with this whole thing of language, culture, and nationhood. No? Um, many people are unaware. Well, actually, this is my fourth Rizal lecture because I also delivered a lecture the other week in Dipono to the Reading Association in the Philippines. Uh, analyze. He had an article urging a revision of Tagalog orthography because we were using the Spanish spelling system which did not have the letter K. And he said we have to have a letter K because it comes closer to the spirit of Tagalog. See him, it's, it's his ideas. No? He, he, he went into everything including spelling systems. No? But Always it was because he wanted to find the Filipino, whether it was in language or spelling or uh, whatever you have there. So we see Rizal's whole social uh, life and networks was moving in this direction. So that by 1887, he wrote to Blumen that we have a group here of friends who publish our newspaper in Madrid. These friends are all youngsters, Creoles, Mestizos, and Malays, but we call ourselves simply Filipinos. No? Many people don't realize the importance of this passage. No? This was the Filipino that was emerging. This was taking it away from the Creoles alone and saying, tayong lahat, pati ang mga Indios, kahit pati ang mga Chinese mestizos, are Filipinos. No? So what happens to medicine? It seems medicine retreated into the background for Rizal. No? We do have his clinical notebooks, which he kept as a student in Madrid. No? And from the notes, it looks like he was still he was still following the Galenic tradition, the idea that we have humors, you know, that uh, like people who have a lot of blood are sanguine, you know? people who are a lot of yellow bile are choleric, to yung uh, mapapahit ang personality nila. You know? And so he would actually describe his patients as sanguine, choleric, lymphatic. You know? And um, this is really classical Greek medicine, which had been preserved by the Islamic golden age of science, and was transferred to Spain and then to your uh, students like Rizal. And at one point, Rizal wrote, you know, he said, I'm reading English, you know, wind, heat, cold, the earth's vapor, you know, uh, vapor would be sing out ng lupa, and indigestion are the leading pathogenic causes in the country. So this is Rizal, the doctor. He was still, uh, he still believed in the climatic influences, which we still have today, but nahanginan, init, lamig, no? uh, and which we're teaching also in the Ateneo Medical School to remind students out there people still believe in these as causes of illness. No? But I'm pointing this out because in the 19th century, Western medicine had actually evolved. No? What had won was the germ theory of medicine, and the miasmic theory had taken, was, was not anymore the dominant uh, uh, dominant line of thinking. So I'm intrigued that he continued to talk about vapors. No? We know he corresponded as well with Rudolf Virchow, who was the father of cellular pathology, but and who was also a social reformer. No? So he probably knew of what was going on in medicine. Virchow wrote that medicine is the most political of sciences. No? And many people are unaware that Virchow was also an anthropologist and ethnologist. No? Uh, he wrote an article called The Peopling of the Philippines no, and many, many other articles. And he, was, he founded the Berlin Society of Anthropology, Ethnology, and Prehistory. And Rizal was a member of this particular society. No? So, so Rizal, the doctor, does not disappear. In fact, we see Rizal, a social, an anthropologist and ethnologist, but coming close to the mode of your child. But we do not know how much of interactions the two had. No? We don't have any uh, letters between the two, but but after Rizal was executed, Virchow actually delivered the eulogy uh, to honor him. Okay, I'm going to skip Virchow now. Uh, my whole point here is that Rizal, Rizal was engaging the Europeans. No? He, he, he wanted to contribute not as the subject of their study, but as someone, a Filipino, writing about Filipino culture. 
we, we move on now to the, the patent. What happens now to Rizal? After studying in Madrid, Rizal went on to Paris, went on to Germany, did more medical, uh, had more medical training, but this is really Rizal, the social scientist. Then, when he returned to the Philippines, he was exiled to the Pitan from 1892 to 1896. And this is where he, we, we see a really intensive practice of medicine. Uh, I was just in the Pitan the other week, and I had a video which I did not bring. I knew I forgot something today, but it's something else to look, to see the Pitan. I, I feel every pre-med and medical student should go there, the pilgrimage. So he practiced medicine, and many people are unaware, he also practiced dentistry, even if he was, did not train as a dentist. No? He also became an engineer. He built a waterwork system, which still exists today. No? He collected specimens of flora and fauna and ethnological artifacts. But this was not so much Rizal the scientist, but Rizal collecting these to barter with Europe for more books. No? He would offer people these uh, collections, and can you send me some books? No? Uh, the Pitan was also the site for Rizal's Colegio Moderno, which was not a college, but a more of a primary and secondary school, where he personally tutored 16 young Filipinos in the arts, humanities, languages, and natural sciences. So if you go to the Pitan, you'll still see the huts. You know, the, well, they're, they're replicas, but they're, they uh, give you a glimpse of what he was doing. And when he was in the Pitan, he wrote in 1895 the treatment of the bewitched, no? accompanied by illustrations. I have two illustrations here. So this one says, uh, Jesus Apoy Naglalata, who ano po ang naroon sa loob, aswang ata. This is a woman who thinks she has an aswang inside her. And then the next one is, Ay inang mamamatay ako, no, oh mother and die. Huwag po kayo matakot, the mother say, at ako man ay bata, ay isang bantog na hilot that the mother is going to heal the child. Rizal was actually poking fun at this. He was skeptical, and yet his, his article, The Treatment of the Bewitch, uh, does show some, some, some insight. He says, between the rat quack who administers the lashing, kasi nilalatigo ang uh, people who would believe to be bewitched would be whipped. No? But he says, between the guy who whips, does the whipping, and the titled professional who denounces the lashes as savagery must be the philosopher-physician who ought to reflect. I want to claim him as the first Filipino medical anthropologist. No? However absurd the practice may seem to reason, if it is accepted by the multitude without compulsion, he has to recognize some foundation for it. So he's telling fellow doctors, you must try to understand what is going on. He goes on to say, witchcraft victims might be victims of suggestion, if not auto-suggestion. And he believed that you have to take the symbols that people have and treat them using those symbols. No? Apparently, he had another article on something called Malimali. No? This is a, another folk illness. No? I don't know if you've ever seen it. Pag nagulat ang isang tao, he starts to repeat everything you say. No? This, this, uh, he wrote about that. But that article has gone missing. No one has ever seen the manuscript. No? Uh, it's very intriguing uh, what he might have wrote there. Okay, I did want to move on. We're actually... I want to move on now to, to Rizal's grappling with this faith. In the Pitan, he continued to, to, to deal with this. No? And you have the famous correspondence with Father Pablo Pastels, who was a Jesuit and who apparently was his teacher in the Ateneo Municipal. It was a friendship that went way, way back there. It was a very intense correspondence no? because Pastels first writes uh, saying he's upset with Rizal's noli, fili, and the uh, annotations to Morga, and tells Rizal, to guard against exaggerated self-judgment and extreme self-esteem. Pastels also says that Rizal has been paid, has, uh, the, the Protestants have come to possess Rizal as well as the Freemasons. Uh, these are very long letters. I'm just going to give you excerpts. No? Rizal answers. He says that he has not become Protestant, but he was impressed when, when he lived in uh, Germany seeing a Catholic priest and a Protestant pastor becoming friends. So he believed in ecumenism, even the term wasn't being used at that time. And he asked, what justifiable reason can, for what justifiable reason can you call anyone the reflector of the light in our little planet? All religions pretend to hold the truth. I'm trying to get you to see what Rizal's faith is like. 
Pastel's answers and binagbanata niya si Descartes, who was one of the Enlightenment um, philosophers, saying that he is to blame for materialism, idealism, pantheism, liberalism, deism, rationalism, incredulity and indifference in religion, romanticism, and naturalism in literature. No? Pastel's raves a lot. No? He also says that Spain had the right to occupy the Philippines and that this was a divine and natural right. He was responding because he to Rizal's political ideas. No? Rizal writes back, no? he says here, I believe firmly in the existence of a creator more than by faith, uh, more than by faith, by reasoning and by necessity. My idea of the infinite is imperfect and confused on seeing his wonderful works, the order that prevails among them, their magnificence and overwhelming extent, and the goodness that shines in everything. His thought humbles me and makes me giddy. You know, when I read this, I was reminded of a passage in Darwin's Origin of the Species, where he speaks in very similar language. You know? And this is what I hope you as natural science uh, majors and as engineering majors will read. You know, that scientists like Darwin and Rizal were also awed by nature and had a kind of spirituality which we need to rediscover. Uh, still Rizal, he says, I listen in suspense to what religions say, and incapable of judging what exceeds my strength, I content myself with studying him in his creatures, my fellow creatures, and in the voice of my conscience. Pastel writes back. Actually, Pastel wrote a lot more. He started quoting scriptures, and basically he was saying, you have to listen with irrevocable faith to the infallible lips of the Catholic Church, to the voice of God, who spoke forward to man by means of revelation. So, in invoke the divine revelation. Rizal goes back, he says, I do not believe revelations impossible, but he does not believe in revelation or revelations that every religion or all religions pretend to possess. So ayaw niya na may nagka-claim dito that one church claims to have a monopoly on revelation. One cannot fail to recognize in all of them, these claims to revelation, the human imprint and the stamp of the time during which they were written. This is a very, very advanced social scientists. These are terms that you find only late in the 20th century. Rizal was using it that early. In the end, Rizal writes back to Pastels very politely. He says, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I sense that you are becoming impatient. So he says, lest I make you waste your time, I'd rather tell you now, let us leave to God the things that are God's and to men the things that are men's. Uh, their father, Pablo Pastels. Uh, there's a lot more, as I said, that he wrote, but I, I'm afraid that we will run out of time. But I hope that gives you an idea of where Rizal was. No? And I wanted to point out that throughout Rizal's years in Europe and the Pita, he maintained contact with several Jesuits. No? Uh, the Jesuits were, in fact, behind the choice of the Pitan for place of exile. They thought that at least they could be with him and that they could probably bring him back to the fold. No? Rizal was in touch with Padre Federico Paura. I don't know if you know Padre Paura. is actually uh, Federico Paura, Jesse, the founder of the Ateneo Observatory and a pioneer of weather forecasting in the Philippines. No, he probably did a better job than Pagasa in the 19th century. No? Rizal visited Padre Paura after coming home from Europe, and the Jesuits tried to convince Rizal to back down from his radical views. But Rizal was very obstinate and parted ways with Padre Faura. No? And Padre Faura actually said Rizal would end up on the scaffold, meaning he would be executed because of his novel. Uh, there's a very touching story in 150, the Ateneo Way, the, the uh, copy table book by Father Jose Arcilla. No? He says that uh, Padre Faura was very upset with Rizal's ex execution. The Ateneo of Tremuras is not very far from Bagumbay. There's even speculation he probably could hear the shots. No? Uh, the, the priest was very ill at that time, and Father Arcilla writes that Padre Faura died shortly after the execution. I did more research and found that indeed he passed away on January 23, 1897, three weeks after Rizal's execution. He was 57. I bring this out to say that he was loved by the Jesuits, and I believe he loved the Jesuits as well. While in exile at the Pita, Rizal attended Mass regularly, even helped to design the altar in the church there. So if you go there, I mean, this is not Rizal the heretic 
excommunicated. They invited him to help design the altar. He was visited by his former instructor in rhetoric, Father Francisco Sanchez, who brought a gift of surveyor's instruments no, so he could do his engineering. Uh, I'm sure there were other exchanges. No? Uh, there's a certain brother, Tildo, no, as Jesuit, who helped Rizal to build the water system for the Pitan. No? So if you go to the Pitan, you'll find that Rizal, the scientist, probably found reinforcement for his ideas about finding God by becoming engaged with communities, with nature, and with the world. Father Raul Bunoan wrote a book about the Rizal Pastel's correspondence, including translations, and he offers a theological critique. No? He notes that Rizal's denial of supernatural revelation and even the divinity of Christ no, uh, was problematic. But Father Bunoan says too that he finds elements that are authentically and refreshingly Catholic and Christian. And he names them the primacy of conscience, the firm belief in God, boundless trust in divine providence, and the profound experience of God as a loving father. Bonoan notes that Pastels was not the best apologist in to defend the faith, and that Pastels had failed to, to understand how Jesuit alumni, Rizal was not alone kasi, but the Jesuit alumni were struggling to lay the foundations of an emergent nation. The fact is, Bonoan writes, it was impossible in 19th century Spain